a bit of a waste. I'm recording now, so I'll start again. So let's welcome everybody to the Tourism Review Future Innovation Webinar Seminar. This is something that we start after a conversation about how uh, good will be to engage different people in conversation, bring some of the associate editors and uh, from around the world to have a conversation about the big issues and especially those people who are going to be leading the special issue on tourism innovations. Uh, before I uh, welcome everybody, I would like to say thank you to Tete because she has been the mastermind behind all that and the University of North Texas that is hosting us today with their technology. I understand that uh, it has been quite a challenge because of the weather and the university is closed and there are a lot of heroic activity happening in order to make sure that we are on air and we are inter uninterrupted and we're working all together. So thank you, Tete. Thank you, University of North Texas. And thank you, colleagues, for joining us. And thank you to the attendees who are uh, uh, attending at the back. So uh, the reason why we're doing it is we're doing this webinar is to provide some guidance on the big issues that we're facing in tourism and to encourage people to submit papers to tourism review, both to the special issue, but also to the regular issues that are addressing some of the big society issues. And everything that we do in tourism review would like to have an impact and would like to have uh, to, to, to benefit communities around the world. So um, I will pass the word to Tese to introduce the special issue. And then Daisy is going to uh, introduce our guests and panelists for the day. OK, so um, go back Tese before you go into that, because I didn't have the slide. So, I just I'm very proud of the slides and the growth of the of the tourism review and would like to we're we're expecting better um, impact factor this year uh, and the side score has already uh, uh, gone to 12.2 for January. So what's happening is that is that the tourism review uh, is relieving the old glories that uh, that that started 78 years ago uh, in 1946 and, and still leading on a whole range of different things. I've done what I've had to do. So that's it. That's uh, you're going to take uh, the, the floor. Thank you, Professor Buhalis. So today, uh, this the topic of this webinar is social innovation in tourism marketing. And we organize this webinar for several reasons. But the very important reason is we realized that COVID has accelerated the technology adoption in our life, which also has tremendous impact on the tourism industry. Now, as the pandemic, is, fade, is fading out, but the paradigm shift in the consumer's behavior stays. So therefore we are, have to rethink the concept of innovation in this new era and explore how innovation could help the tourism industry to adapt to the new normal post pandemic and also uh, how, help to shape the future of tourism with competitive advantage. To this end, our journal, Tourism Review, is developing a special issue on the topic of reshaping future tourism through innovation. You can scan the QR code on this slide to see the details of the CFP for this special issue. The submission platform it has opened, and the submission deadline for this special issue is May 31st. So please submit your paper to this special issue. And now, Daisy, it's your turn. Okay, thank you so much, Dimitris and uh, CC. Um, today, we are so glad to have a full uh, guest speakers in our panel, and each of them will give around 
a 10 minute speech about our topic and then we'll open for the discussion across our panelists and also our audience in the uh, in the room okay so uh, our first guest speaker will be professor peter o'connor so Peter is Professor of Strategic Management and the co-director of the Center of for Enterprise Dynamics in Global Economics at the University of South Australia Business School. His primary research and teaching interests focus on the focus on the effect of digital on business, particularly on retailing and the marketing. Peter has published in leading academic journals, including uh, Journal of Marketing, How Business Review, Journal for Retailing and Consumer Services, Tourism Management, uh, the uh, Cornell Quarterly and International Journal for Hospitality Management, among the others. Prior to joining the University of South Australia, Peter founded the Chair in Digital Disruption at ASEC Business School in France where he held a variety of other academic roles. So now let's welcome Peter, please. Okay, everybody. Um, I actually thought I was speaking last, but it doesn't make any <laughs> difference to me. <laughs> you, you, you were speaking last and you will speak last, Peter. I, I think we, okay, were starting, we were starting with Billy. Oh, so, really? Yeah, the order, I don't know. The order was Billy, Yuli, Guy and Peter, so we were going. Yeah, the from... order is right here on the on the oh, slide. Sorry, I think my my order is a little bit different. But I can introduce uh, Professor Billy Bai, of course. <laughs> okay. Can I do that, Professor yeah. Billy Bai? I think we were going geographically from uh, <laughs> west to east or something. Oh, okay. <laughs> So, all right, if that is, uh, it's okay, may I, uh, just introduce Professor Billy Bai um, at first. So Professor Billy Bai is a uh, professor and associate dean for research at the uh, William F. Harrop College of Hospitality at the University of uh, uh, Nevada, Las Vegas, where he holds the Sam and Mary Boyd Distinguished Chair Professorship. His current research focuses on hospitality and tourism marketing, emphasizing relationship marketing, uh, customer behavior and loyalty, technological impacts on decision making, branding and the destination marketing. He has published numerous top journal um, articles in hospitality and tourism. Dr. Bai is a recipient of many research <coughs> awards, including the John Valley and the Science Lifetime Research Achievement Award from ICRI. Um, so may I please invite Professor Bidi Bai to speak first? All right, thank you very much. Uh, Daisy, Dr. Fan, um, it's uh, really my great pleasure to be uh, on this dis distinguished panel to talk about the issues surrounding future innovations in tourism marketing. Uh, I prepared a few slides and I'd like to share uh, with everybody. Um, I don't have the right to share. Tete is going to give you power. Okay. All right. Now I have. I... Oops. Oops. Oh, I, I clicked <laughs> the wrong button. I'm sorry. This is too much power for one day, right? <laughs> yeah. Tete has got so much powers can make him disappear. <laughs> Billy, please come back. Oh, I moved him to the... To okay, the... okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Billy's going to come back in a minute, okay? So don't worry about that. I can go, Demetrius, if you want me to. Yeah, could we... Yeah, just to, while we are or figuring you want... him out. Oh, yeah, he's, he's, oh, no, he's back. back, he's back. back. Well, he, back. He, <laughs> he knows the way back. Exactly, Billy, I, told you... I live in Vegas, so uh, yeah, exactly. I, I, like, I like this entertainment. Uh, you kick me out, and then uh, I will invite you back again. Uh, sorry, I, I, I love it. making I... host and then kick you to the attendee is just next to each other. All right, um, you see my uh, slides here? Yeah, you can uh, uh, maximize them, and they'll be fine. Okay. Perfect. Thanks All so right. much. Okay. Uh, so my talk is going to be very brief, and and I was I was given a really 
tough talking here. Um, um, Dimensions, destinations, very huge. So I was preparing for this short talk. I decided to um, uh, really take a, per, uh, a pragmatic approach. Instead of talking theories and frameworks, I'm going to present to you a sort of a case study and, and see how the, the, the destination leverage uh, innovation. And um, uh, especially as we uh, have stepped sort of out of the pandemic uh, influence. Um, so, you know, I have my virtual background in, in, in this and um, everybody knows this is Las Vegas, but uh, this is the sort of uh, uh, image that comes to people's mind when you come, when Las Vegas is mentioned as a, as a tourist destination. Um, so, but this is not the image that we uh, had experienced uh, three years ago. Uh, this is the, st I don't think you were able to come here at that time even. Um, as soon as we experienced the lockdown in March 2020, this is the city uh, that you are seeing here. No neon lights, no traffic, no whatever. The 4.2 mile Las Vegas Street was an eyesore. Um, but the good news is our industry um, has been very resilient. Um, as you can see, even we don't have any much traffic inside the casinos and hotels. This is what people uh, started to have fun, right? They gamble with a mask on through uh, plexiglasses. Um, the fun continue, but in a very limited capacity. Uh, what I like to do next is, is to uh, you know use this uh, as a as a case study uh, to demonstrate how the city the destination leveraged uh, innovation. And, and now as we speak, we are back more than 90% of the 2019 uh, visitation volume. So, so, so the destination has been doing very well. And I'd like to share some of their successes and, and, and practices. Um, this is one of my favorite restaurants in town, a very uh, close to campus is called Fago de Chao. It's a very popular Brazilian steakhouse. This is what you normally see um, at, at the restaurant. They have a salad bar and, and uh, we staff come to the uh, tables to serve uh, what's being ordered and they have a table talk. But during the pandemic, this is what happened. They had to set up a tent um, uh, so that it could continue uh, the operation and, and while observing social uh, distancing um, and, and they survived. This is another example. Uh, during the pandemic, Resource World Las Vegas was erupted um, in 2021. As you see from the top of the building, Resource World is a sort of alien to the North American market is owned by Genting um, Hotel Group in Malaysia. So what they did was in was uh, 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 partnering with, with Hilton at that time, and still they do, and, and they try to make sure that the North American market is familiar with, with this product concept when it comes to uh, the new destination. So they have Hilton brand, they have um, Conrad and, and so many others. So, so people will get close and, and familiar with this uh, product. And they have the world's largest uh, LED display on the building. I think it's over 100,000 square feet. Um, very uh, successful. Um, so if we put everything together, uh, what Las Vegas presented to us was, was the destination is very accessible um, and, and it has built a very strong infrastructure. At this time, we have over 150,000 um, um, rooms uh, the city offers. And we have one of the uh, busiest airports and interstates uh, um, uh, you know, come through the city. And at this point, we're talking about is uh, constructing express train from, from LA. And then Elon Musk um, has built is a, 
a boring company's Vegas loop system to really shorten the distance from the airport to convention space. And uh, once uh, visitors arrive the city, we have a monorail that can transport uh, visitors uh, in the city. Um, the other thing that uh, has uh, become a very successful ingredient um, to the recovery and success of, of, of the destination is in terms of uh, product development, we're not just a gaming city. That's what we um, uh, had been pictured in the past. But now if you look at this, um, in terms of revenue, more than half of the revenue actually uh, was obtained, uh, has been obtained from the non-gaming uh, side of things. Uh, so in, 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 in addition to gaming, we have other uh, non-gaming elements, um, wedding, dining, conventions, uh, shopping, uh, golfing, and entertainment. And, and what I'd like to show you next is that in terms of marketing, we have a very integrated marketing approach um, that includes all the marketing uh, channels that really uh, communicate a very consistent message or image about what Las Vegas is all about. And this is nothing new. Uh, Las Vegas has been known as the preferred uh, tourist destination for events, uh, not just uh, exhibitions and trade shows, uh, at like one of the largest uh, consumer uh, econo um, um, electronic um, uh, shows known as CES, but but all the other uh, musical and 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 events. Um, one of the favorite ones was last April when BTS came to town and people from all all over the world traveled to uh, Las Vegas to experience what the city has to offer. And now what's going uh, 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 going on now is, is the city has added another dimension of product mix to uh, what's being offered, sports. So we have T-Mobile Arena that has become the home to um, Golden Knights uh, hockey team. And also during the pandemic, we um, constructed the um, Allegiant Stadium that can accommodate up to 65,000 um, 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 uh, um, people. And it's also the home uh, to Raiders uh, football football team. And for those of you who are a, a fan of uh, American football, please mark it on your calendar next year, 2024, the Super Bowl game will be held in Las Vegas in this stadium. So I'm looking forward to uh, welcome you uh, to town. and. Uh, what is good about this stadium is, is traditionally, okay, it's just a stadium, but now what has been added to this stadium is, is uh, many uh, private lounges. So um, it, it makes it possible for uh, the stadium to make incremental revenue. And finally, and I'll stop here and, and, and then we'll, I'll let other panelists to share what they have in mind and then we'll continue with the discussion. The other thing about Las Vegas uh, as a tourist destination is, if you look at uh, this uh, known uh, this picture known as the city center in Las Vegas, um, as a matter of fact, um, this uh, model, integrated resort model, has been replicated. It started off with the Merida Bay Sands and um, Resorts World Santoso in Singapore, and and now, in a few years' time, we're going to see this. Ten a uh, one billion dollar, ten billion dollar um, um, ten billion dollar development project in Osaka, Japan, uh, developed by MGM. Uh, so uh, you know innovation continues, and I, I think in the future, we are not just looking at what the, the destination currently has to offer, but we really need to, think big and differently into the future and see what we can do um, to borrow ideas from other industries to make our destination successful. Um, uh, I'll stop here and, and then I'll look forward to uh, uh, the follow-up discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Billy. Yeah, um, I think now we're 
Now let's move to our second speaker, uh, Dr. Rekha Brezzo. Okay. Um, so Dr. Rekha Brezzo is a senior fellow at the Center for Public Relations, University of South California. And she's a director of research at um, uh, Netnographica. She received her PhD in communications from the University of Illinois at uh, Urbana Champaign. Her research spans the design, use and implications of emerging technologies, ranging from uh, mobile applications to smart cities, robots and the metaverse. She has over 20 years of experience conducting academic and practice uh, focused research. She's frequently acknowledged as one of the most cited authors in the fields of tourism and the persuasion. And she's an elected fellow of the International Academy for the Study of Tourism. So please welcome um, Dr. Rick Grezzo. Thank you, Daisy, for this introduction. And uh, I um, have to let you know that my uh, buddy, uh, Bear the Cat, is here too. He loves uh, <laughs> webinars and Zoom meetings. So if you hear me out, uh, welcome. <laughs> Um, he also tends to uh, walk over my keyboard and turn the sound off and do crazy things like that. So we'll see how it goes. Um, thanks so much for having me as part of this panel. And uh, thank you, Billy, for this uh, case study. Uh, um, we couldn't have coordinated it better. I think you really showed us uh, some important dimensions here where uh, destinations went into a state of shock uh, for some time, but they actually uh, bounced back fairly quickly, some of course faster than others. And I think the diversity of the offering that Las Vegas has uh, contributed uh, to that, uh, uh, as well as uh, maybe some of the more, um, uh, well, some of the politics <laughs> of, uh, of the state of Nevada and Las Vegas. but. Um, uh, in general, I think uh, we saw a pause, uh, but we did not see the rupture or the, um, um, the you know, this completely, this rethinking, this, uh, this revolution in tourism that maybe um, we kind of expected or some of us were hoping for in some ways. Um, so most destinations are back to business. And uh, there's not a lot of um, hotels that have really gone away. Um, many of them were bailed out by the governments. Uh, many of them were able to just um, uh, you know, do different things. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys have watched White Lotus, one of the most innovative uh, ways where uh, a hotel in Hawaii basically said to a production company, um, uh, we have a, a hotel, uh, why don't you come and produce an, an HBO series uh, while we are uh, shut down. So uh, there's, there's some things that have changed I and mean, they, they do have labor shortage to deal with, I think around the world. Um, a lot of people, um, you know, just searched for other opportunities. Um, a lot of people also, maybe international workers went home. Um, and have not come back. Um, they have introduced some automation. Uh, I was recently in Hawaii. There's now a, a towel uh, automation kind of thing, a uh, process where you have um, uh, basically a, a, a towel dispensing system where you use an RFID wristband. Uh, so you no longer have that uh, towel a uh, person hand you a towel for the beach. Um, and a lot of places are using QR codes. Uh, they were happy to do that, right? They uh, didn't want to have to deal with menus. So some automation, um, some restructuring because of less uh, staff, um, but uh, most of them are back and not just back, but actually going crazy and really exploiting this new phase of revenge travel. So um, that little um, uh, caption there with the one king bed, uh, ocean view bungalow, that's uh, um, the uh, Hyatt in, in uh, Maui in Hana. Um, and uh, believe it or not, this is for basically next week, I think, 
they charge almost a thousand dollars a night. So uh, this is uh, this is the reality now. The hotels are um, basically saying, "Well, uh, we need to make up some of the lost money," uh, and it seems like people are actually willing to pay this. So. Uh, when I was there, Maui was super busy. So apparently consumers do have the spending power um, to pay for this. But what is going on is that I think the hotel industry is ignoring a tsunami that is kind of approaching from their back, from their behind. And uh, yes, that tsunami is literally um, uh, maybe a natural disaster, it is climate change. Uh, there's all sorts of um, things happening, like the energy crisis. Uh, but that tsunami, I think, is also coming from changes in the consumer world. Uh, so if you could move on to the next slide. I uh, think there's a lot happening, a lot uh, going on uh, in the world of consumers. And when I say consumers, uh, we have to think about what that actually means. Um, but um, our consumers, uh, yes, they adopted technology during the pandemic. So even uh, people like my parents now uh, have downloaded apps, uh, have learned how to do WhatsApp and, and uh, um, you know, share, share messages, read QR codes and all that kind of stuff. Um, but beyond that, um, they have also experienced tremendous loss. They have come out of this pandemic with a lot of things to worry about. Uh, in different areas of this world, we have, um, we have war, we have um, uh, immigration, we have terrorism, we have um, uh, also worry about inflation, right? So yes, it seems that a lot of people are still able to travel to Las Vegas and Hawaii, uh, but then there's also a lot of people who are losing uh, their jobs or losing their homes. Uh, so um, a lot of um, emotional uh, baggage that consumers are carrying with them from this pandemic. Um, a lot of health issues, including mental health issues uh, that have emerged. And I think maybe also more of an awareness um, of um, um, mental health issues. And, and uh, I think we're not very good in tourism to acknowledge uh, these. And I think um, also, if you think about it, a lot of new identities that consumers have developed during the pandemic. They, they have changed their roles, they have uh, maybe even changed their gender. They took that break to kind of reinvent themselves in many ways. Uh, diversity, a uh, huge issue, but then also think about um, uh, police brutality or attacks on, on uh, Asian residents here in the US. So uh, a lot of also uh, more salience of the identity of consumers and, and who they are. Um, they also have developed a new relationship to work, not just in the tourism industry, but in general. So I'm not sure if you've heard of quiet um, uh, quitting where people have actually decided that, um, you know, uh, stressing over work is, is not, not um, the way to go or they just do the work, um, but really they're focused on other aspects of life. Um, they, because they work from home a lot, they have invested a lot in their homes, they have adopted new pets, they have restructured their houses, they have actually maybe uh, moved uh, outside of the cities, they have invested in uh, um, uh, things that make their house actually a place of entertainment and leisure. And so um, I think a lot of people have actually um, kind of gotten used to the idea of the staycation. And, and so from a tourism perspective, how do we actually get people to move out of this Again, now we see a lot of people traveling because it's, uh, you know, it's the, the pent up demand. Uh, but on the other hand, I think a lot of people are also now very comfortable in their homes. And so what will that uh, mean? In, um, 
in general, I think there's a search of purpose in consumers' lives more than ever, also because uh, Gen Z is really growing up and um, uh, they, they are much more uh, focused on uh, purpose and value. Uh, people are also in search of passion and maybe new passions. Uh, it might have been travel before, but they, they um, I think, uh, were focused on discovering new things that they liked. Um, they might be in new relationships. So I think um, there's a challenge here for the tourism industry uh, as well as an opportunity. Now, I said, when we talk about consumers, we need to think about who we are talking about. These consumers are also residents. Uh, they are the residents of Las Vegas who actually experience what it's like when the tourists are gone. And they, they have actually um, also, yeah, uh, some were worried about this, uh, about their jobs, but others, I think, very much um, enjoyed that. Um, they are also employees. And uh, we know that the tourism industry is not very, um, uh, not known for treating their employees very well, very often. Um, so um, uh, that's something to consider. A lot of them have become activists. Um, a lot of them are actually influencers. Uh, we now are talking about nano influencers. So it doesn't take a huge audience, uh, especially if you think about platforms like TikTok uh, to influence others and to influence others also in relation to tourism uh, activities or behaviors. And then um, we also have more and more machines that are now becoming um, consumers or customers. And so uh, we have to think about um, how we also market to AI. Uh, right, so we now have to think about uh, how machines are going to represent us to consumers and how consumers and machines are increasingly collaborating uh, to, uh, you know, structure the travel or to find the best deal or whatever it is. So I think a lot going on on the consumer side, um, but these are my first uh, thoughts that hopefully will uh, contribute to this discussion. That's Thanks, fantastic. Right. What a huge range of very interesting things. Yes, indeed. Um, yeah, so let's uh, uh, move on to the uh, third speakers today. Um, now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Goyen Lokham as the third speaker. Um, he's an aviation and tourism management professor and the deputy director of the Griffiths Institute for Tourism and Griffiths University. He has authored uh, several books, including Tourism Theories, um, Concepts, Model, and uh, Systems, published by CAB International, and also co edited the book Tourism in Brazil, Environment, Management, and the Segments. Goy is the founder and the previously executive director of uh, Abrita, the International Academy for the Development of Tourism Research in Brazil. His research interests include air, air, um, air transport management, um, tourism development, travel behavior, and airline business models. He is currently a member of the Tourism Economics and Management Research Center at the University of uh, Sao Paulo uh, in Brazil. So welcome, Dr. Gui Lohan. Thanks, Daisy. Hello, um, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to be uh, speaking today. I also very much proud of being associate editor of Tourism Review, and uh, it's fascinating to see the work that Demetrius and the team has done with, with the journal. Certainly a fantastic outcome for, for all of us in academia. So today I wanna briefly um, bring you a combination of uh, uh, future innovations in aviation in terms of the passenger experience, I try to mix very briefly um, some of the work that we've academic work that we've done, as well as with some uh, practical examples. So, if we could go to the next slide, please. What I want to talk to you today is basically um, some of the, the the work regarding the diffusion of innovation theory. Uh, Rogers started uh, quite early on in in the '60s with that showing the aviation technology trajectory and emerging technologies being diffused 
to a, a transformational perspective, uh, particularly playing a significant role in improving the traveler's uh, journey and how we can leverage competitiveness uh, in the aviation uh, sector, uh, particularly with a knowledge intensive industry. We've seen many, many innovations. Um, uh, you know, the, the first computer reservation systems that airlines had, we've seen uh, youth management being uh, initiated by several airlines. So airlines for many, many decades have been a place of significant innovation for business in general and for the travel industry. However, there's been some barriers uh, in, in many, many uh, ways. And uh, as uh, CC mentioned earlier on, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has offered an opportunity for technological advancement, uh, primarily due to the readiness perspective um, to change uh, uh, to a new, a new way of uh, doing business and engaging with the passenger. Um, in the last uh, decades, this in innovation has found space. Um, and what we can see today is uh, a desire for sustainability, personalized services, uh, airlines and airports, a significant amount of data that is not even tapped at the moment to offer more personalized services and also towards a safer and more secure uh, environment. So if you just go to the next one, please, um, we've done some work um, here at Griffith University uh, with one of our PhD students. And uh, we've published a series of uh, journal articles to look at the role of collaboration towards innovation and value creation for the aviation industry. Um, and we also have mapped out um, uh, a detailed review and I'll leave uh, just briefly in the next slide, um, a quick overview of what we found out. So what we've done uh, in this uh, literature review, uh, basically over uh, a, a 20 year period between 1999 and, and 2019, is a combination, I mean, through, through uh, a significant search, we, we actually search around nearly 2,500 um, articles to then um, bog down to about 57 that we analyze it in our, in our paper. And through thematic and content analysis, uh, we consolidate these findings uh, and develop some of the things that I am presenting to you in that uh, pizza chart. On, on the right there in terms of the, of, of the areas um, of, um, of innovation. Um, probably gonna go to the next one. I just wanna give you also some um, real industry experiences of, uh, of innovation or what's happening. The first one is automation and, and robotics. Um, uh, autonomous robots are becoming increasingly prevalent at airports in particular to deliver retail and food and beverage. So they're not just at your uh, favorite sushi train shop these days. Um, and um, I don't know about you folks, but when I see some of them, they still scare me a little bit. So I think there's some work to be done in there to make them a little bit more friendly, a little bit more uh, appealing. Um, and uh, I've been in a situation where people laughing at me how I reacted to the presence of uh, one of them. I don't, I don't know about your experience. Um, interesting, this example from uh, Pittsburgh International Airport, they actually, and this is one of the things that we did in the studies, they map out airports and airlines that use startups and innovation uh, incubators to develop um, new technology and work closely with startups. So I just want to leave that uh, uh, example that they created through the Exbridge Innovation Center uh, in the US. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, the second one, which could be somehow related to uh, to the previous one, is AI machine learning. We're all seeing this now <laughs> with chat GPT um, around and uh, suddenly created a, a buzz in, in higher education as well. There's a lot of uh, possibilities and uh, we see this example from Korean Air to introduce machine learning uh, to basically improve a customer experience in terms of passenger forecast and, and cargo uh, demand as well. Uh, the next slide, I want to talk about the metaverse, uh, the digital twin um, environment. And I know that there is a recent paper in Truth Review, Dimitrius, that I've, I've seen that has been published. So we expect that more and more this will be the case moving forward. Uh, this immersive virtual reality experience 
uh, where the customers can have a much better um, feeling for uh, the experience. So I think tourism is a perfect environment for that. Um, I mean, we could have talked about uh, AIs in so many ways in tourism as well. I don't wanna, I don't wanna divert too much, but one example is putting itineraries together in a trip with, uh, with artificial intelligence. It, intelligence is gonna be a lot easier to just capture information once you realize the places that you wanna go and times that places are open and closed and, and so forth. But just coming back to this example of uh, Qatar Airways, they've launched, uh, I think it's one of the first airlines, they, they launched the Qverse, um, which is a bare metaverse environment, um, a, a virtual reality experience that uh, visitors of the airline website uh, can basically uh, have a, a digital interaction in terms of how the customer experience will be once, once they board uh, the plane. Uh, the next slide, please, uh, is personalization, as I mentioned earlier on. It's staggering to me that with the amount of information the airlines have about all of us, um, starting with frequent flight uh, programs, for example, that they hardly provide customized experiences. I've seen one of the best that I've seen is actually Air New Zealand. They, they do this quite well in terms of the entertainment center, uh, entertainment system and how they engage with um, um, the passengers, but but more and more, um, we will expect uh, um, sort of like an end-to-end -end personalization at every step of the journey. Um, uh, one example that I identify was Delta Sync. Uh, it's underpinned by the SkyMouse membership, and basically what they do is it through the a free Wi-Fi, they can deliver personalized and exclusive in-flight entertainment and more ways for passengers to enjoy on board food and beverage and some exclusive partnerships uh, with top consumer brand. Just one example, when you order your, your food, why we can all do, do this well in advance so there's minimized waste of food on board. As you know, um, all food on board has to be incinerated um, afterwards. Uh, the next slide, number five, uh, new approaches to retailing that are clearly an opportunity for moving forward in transforming airline retailing. Um, for example, with payment innovation, uh, book innovations, and all you can fly subscription services coming up. This is a quite an interesting one, particularly in the age of uh, uh, sustainable aviation, but perhaps one we saw that um, there's, a, there's an opportunity for subscription services in flying. Uh, a recent example is the uh, Fin Air collaboration with um, Amadeus to build a next generation airline retail offering where uh, personalization and real time insights including dynamic pricing, uh, upselling, cross selling, bundling, and unbundling support uh, during uh, their travel. Number next one is urban uh, air mobility. Um, Continue to gain momentum uh, last year in 2022. Uh, there are several airlines and airports around the world accelerating this uh, trend. Uh, one company is uh, Eve Air Mobility. Uh, it's a Brazilian uh, subsidiary of uh, Embraer, which produce electrical vehicles takeoff and landing, uh, also known as uh, EV tall aircraft. Um, uh, here in uh, Southwest Queensland, there's significant consideration for that technology. Uh, that company in particular was founded in October 2020. Um, and Eve is a brand that was uh, sort of like the allies uh, between Embraer and their um, innovation arm, which is called Embraer X. Uh, there are many, many benefits uh, for communities and environments in, tho in those oil electric EV tolls, starting with uh, zero uh, local emission. And the other also benefit is that it has significant lower uh, noise footprint when compared to uh, helicopters. Um, and number seven, um, the biometrics and digital identity. Um, I don't know if you if you start seeing this when you travel. Um, Brisbane Airport has significantly reshaped that uh, experience. It's actually quite fast. Uh, I came back the other day from New Zealand. It took me only 15 seconds to go through uh, immigration. But the post-pandemic uh, you know, preference for contactless technology has certainly accelerated the biometric adoption 
and the acceptance, acceptance by travelers. The other one also is the body scan. It's actually a lot easier to go through uh, um, immigration when you are uh, in your departure um, a position. Um, IGA Istanbul Airport uh, has started uh, testing a technology by Star Alliance Biometric System, and they are working with Turkish Airlines, of course, as part of uh, an effort to deliver a contactless uh, travel experience. So watch that space in your, in your next trip. And the final one for us to wrap up is, of course, sustainability. Uh, we know how much in the minds of a lot of people uh, avoiding traveling or conscious about their carbon emission impact. Uh, the industry is significantly committed to a sustainable aviation uh, moving forward. Uh, it is a priority of, uh, of the sector, despite uh, the easy target that airlines uh, became, because it will be probably one of the last sectors to, to transition. But what we can see in this space is a combination of initiatives, including sustainable aviation fuels, uh, a technology that is already available, but unfortunately at the time, at the moment, it costs about three times more than the normal fuel. New aircraft technology, more efficient operations and infrastructure, uh, the development of uh, zero emissions and energy sources, including electric and hydrogen power. Uh, just in terms of hydrogen, we need to make, a, a, one, of, one of the challenges with hydrogen is that, uh, is the amount of energy required uh, some of the conversations, not conversations, but an idea put forward is actually to use nuclear power. And, and the minute you mentioned nuclear power it becomes quite a sensitive topic to a lot of people. So quite a, quite a complicated space. Um, another example of Air New Zealand is the announcement that they will be working uh, in a mission to really be a zero emissions uh, demonstrated flight for, for cargo uh, and passenger passengers taking off, uh, taking off in 2026. So I, I will wrap up basically with the, some of the final remarks from, from that publication that we, we put together. There are sev several factors influencing uh, this emergency of solutions for a better uh, passenger journey. Um, it seems the aviation sector um, involves many, many global connections as we know, markets and, and high volume of people at airports and airplanes. And uh, there's clearly, a need to foster innovations in terms of the networks and the partner collaborations that has to uh, take place. But there's also an industry that is uh, very much focused towards safety and that can uh, take significant uh, uh, repercussions in terms of new technology being, being adopted as well. So I'll, I'll finish here. The next slide is, uh, has my contacts. I have to apologize. I might not be able to stay for the whole Q&A session because I have a, a parental duty to drop a, a kid at school in about 20 minutes. But uh, thank you for the opportunity. If there are any questions that I'm, I'm not able to answer because I'm not here, uh, feel free to uh, reach out to me. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you thank, for the uh, very you. inspiring um, topics and also give us different uh, uh, dimensions uh, for us to consider. Um, our very last uh, panelist for this uh, panel is Professor Peter O'Connor. Um, we're sorry to pick you up at the first beginning, but of course we'll leave the best uh, for the last. Uh, I don't think I need to introduce you once again, but uh, I think um, we all know you very well. Um, okay, so do you want to share the screen with us, Peter? I do when you give me the ability to share the screen or CC, I don't know who's doing that. I am now the co-host, yay. <laughs> this will stop others uh, screen sharing. Yes, okay, uh, here we go. And we should be okay. Yeah, okay. So uh, it's interesting, uh, you know, different parts of the world. Good morning from South Australia this time rather than from um, uh, Queensland. Uh, Guy talked about uh, his parental duties in terms of uh, taking kids to school. I, you may have seen me flashing on and off during the seminar there. That's me making sure that my kids were dressed and pushing them out the door to make sure that they got to school as well. So different parts of the world, different times. So um, I, I, I think uh, I'm going to take a slightly different approach to what many people have taken during this uh, seminar. And it's worked very, very well in terms of the progression. So 
I think the first thing we can agree on is that everybody agrees that innovation is a priority. And, you know, we constantly hear in the media about all of the innovations that are revolutionizing how we experience travel, how we connect with the customer, and they're even changing the nature of the travel business itself. But you know what? Um, I have to admit that I'm probably going to be the maverick here because despite all the wonderful examples that he gave earlier on and that we hear about all the time, I don't believe that we in the tourism sector do a very good job when it comes to driving innovation. And that doesn't matter whether you're talking about uh, in general or in the specific area that I've been asked to talk about today, which is about technology in tourism marketing. Now, this may surprise you a little bit because um, surely with uh, all the developments we have in technology, with all these sexy things such as metaverse and Bitcoin, AR and VR, robotization, artificial intelligence, machine learning, smart tourism, uh, what else was mentioned, Ch chat, uh, GPT, and much, much more. With all of this stuff happening in the world at large, surely uh, innovation is uh, an area, tourism is an area where we're going to have lots and lots of innovation with tourism businesses engaging in disruptive and radical innovation, leveraging these new developments to create additional value for their consumers, for the company, and for other stakeholders. Now, what I would say to you is, despite what it says on the slide here, I think that for the tourism sector, not only is there a box, but when it comes to applying these new developments to what we do and how we work, we as an industry remain very, very, very firmly in that box. And if I was to be a little bit provocative, and I would even say just a little bit provocative, I'm gonna say that in the tourism industry, we don't actually do innovation. We're really, really, really bad. And this of course is a pity because, you know, we live in a world where we have a highly dynamic environment where things are constantly changing. We have black swan events. And of course we have intensifying competition both from within the sector and also from outside the sector. And that makes being able to survive, adapt and overcome more critical than ever. One of my favorite quotes is this one from Gary Hamill. The essence of strategy lies in creating tomorrow's competitive advantages faster than competitors can mimic the ones you possess today. And you know what? Innovation, innovation is how we do this. Innovation can even create new industries or destroy old ones, as we've seen by the big tech companies' use of platforms in the vacation and rental and in the transportation spaces with Airbnb and Uber, respectively. That's what innovation is supposed to be all about, driving change. But now when I look at tourism and tourism marketing, I'm fairly disappointed. Why am I so skeptical? Well, let's start by looking at what we mean by innovation. And I would say to you that despite how widely this phrase innovation is used, or I would say overused, innovation is really just one step on a spectrum that runs from idea through invention to innovation and finally imitation. And when we start looking at what's going on in closely aligned sectors, like for example, B2C retail, within tourism marketing, we're definitely failing to move beyond this idea stage. Uh, and really we're, you know, we're talking about potential rather than taking those ideas, inventing products, services, and process that will actually make a difference and add value for the customer. So we're not getting as far as innovation. We're not even getting as far as invention. We have all of these ideas, which might be possibly good in the future, but we're failing to run with them. Just think to yourself, of all of the technologies that I mentioned earlier on, how many of them are currently being successfully leveraged in a mainstream manner by tourism businesses. Maybe AI, machine learning, but everything else is basically either experimental or proof of concept. We talk about, oh, this company is using AI, but it's the exception rather than the rule. And 
That's very much different to what we see in related sectors. So firstly, we're failing to move along the spectrum and convert potential into profit. In many cases, leaving others from outside the sector to realize this potential and implement these ideas in meaningful ways, which is causing leakage in terms of value and profitability. Are you depressed yet? It gets worse. If we ignore the definition issue and we move along to adoption, Adoption of these technologies is basically at a very, very, very basic level. If we try to position most of them on Rogers Diffusion of Innovation graphs, I think we can safely say that there are few companies exploiting these development technologies, um, such as the ones I mentioned earlier on. The few that are doing it, it's either tech enthusiasts or early adopters. And most of the technologies have as yet failed to cross the chasm and be used by anything close to, forget about the majority, but even a lot of tourism businesses. Now, an awful lot of this hesitation has to do with the fact that in contrast to what Guy talked about in the airline sector, um, many sectors of tourism are dominated by SMEs with limited resources, financial capabilities and management bandwidth. These companies tend to be more concerned about who's going to serve breakfast tomorrow morning rather than figuring out how to evolve, reinvent, or recreate their product, service, experience, business model, or value proposition to make themselves more successful in the future. Even though they are precisely the type of company that has the flexibility and the agility to do this, but they are very, very unlikely to proactively break the mold by radically altering what they do and the way in which they operate. Which brings me to my last point, which is the type of innovation that we typically see from tourism businesses. And basically, the type of innovation that we normally see from tourism businesses is cluttered down there. I know I'm reversed here, so I have to go on this side. Cluttered down there in the bottom left-hand corner with companies taking established, existing, well-established technologies and applying them to existing markets. Now, this may lead to some minor efficiency improvements, but it's not tremendously sexy or exciting. Disruptive innovation or applying new and developing technologies to existing markets, it gets a lot more intention. And companies that successfully do it can gain some short-term significant com uh, competitive advantage, particularly if they're taking a differentiation rather than a cost leadership approach. But what worries me most is that so few tourism companies are leveraging new technology developments to move up into the top part of that diagram. So the top right-hand side of the diagram and open up new markets and opportunities. It took two designers who knew nothing about the hospitality business to leverage the platform concept, which was already well established by retail and OTAs to develop what is now the biggest lodging brand in the world, Airbnb. And even few fewer people in the tourism sector are thinking radically and exploring how to leverage all of these new and exciting technological developments to open up new and unexplored markets. Perhaps I'm showing my age here when I say, to boldly go where no man has gone before. So you know what? I'm gonna go back to where I started from. Everybody agrees that innovation is important, but how many tourism and hospitality companies commit to innovating in any sort of a meaningful way? Most are simply engaging in innovation theater. Oh, we have a digital hotel room. Oh, we're using biometrics, but we actually don't do much like it. They're doing the equivalent of greenwashing and not in reality making any significant investments, changes, commitments, or having much effect. To me, it's very, very clear. We as an industry have a problem with innovation. Even if we don't, the new mantra of innovation is, if it ain't broke, break it before somebody else does. So we need to get the sector to positively engage with innovation and push the boundaries of what they're doing. Now we're talking about research. So one of the things here that I've put up is a few suggestions for research areas that need to be addressed. 
I'm not going to run through them all, but I'm just going to highlight the first one, which I'm sure my, my colleague, Professor Buhalas, will disagree with, because um, promoting tourism adoption or technology adoption among tourism SMEs, we've been talking about this now. Demetrius has been talking about it for, for, for probably, how old are you, Demetrius? Probably 150 years at this stage. And he I'm, says it's I'm well understood, but guess, guess what? It still is not happening. And you come to a new country like Australia and you see what's happening in this market and you go, oh my God. We need to overcome the barriers to actually innovating, understand why technology these are failing to cross the chasm in tourism and tourism marketing, understand how to move from incremental and architectural to disruptive and radical innovation and help people think differently as regards technology when it comes to tourism businesses. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Peter, that's wonderful. So now we've had our four panelists. We lost one who is going to go and deliver some kids to a school. Um, so we still uh, have got three panelists around and we can also contribute. I really want to thank you all for giving us such a wonderful uh, uh, panorama of of issues on innovation and, and starting with Billy, with um, the case study of Las Vegas, which is of course so innovative because if you think about it, it's a miracle built on a desert. Uh, and, and it keeps innovating over and over and over uh, 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 developing that destination. Then Yuli looked into a whole range of uh, new customer needs and new innovations in order to address the customer requirements and get um, different people in different parts of the world to operate within sustainable parameters and to uh, uh, make tourism useful to communities around the world. Then we had Guy looking into a whole range of innovations in transportation and all the things that they are driving. And then Peter uh, explaining how technology is going to bring or not bring uh, a lot of very uh, interesting uh, contributions to the uh, to industry and 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 at the same time questioning what do we do and what we don't do and why you don't we don't do. I think if if anybody is to listen to this uh, webinar very carefully, there are about three hundred papers somewhere in there, and a lot of these are quite they'll be quite original uh, rather than the kind of uh, let's write another paper, because a lot of the issues that you hear today are very much uh, pap uh, papers or research questions that they're really cutting edge and they really are going to drive the agenda for the future. I think let's give the opportunity to our audience to ask questions. I think the best way is to um, uh, put questions on the Q&A and then Tete is going to distribute to all of us and then we can see who can answer each of them. Yes, thank you. Thank you all the panelists for a great presentation. And we now have uh, two, three questions in the chat, in the q and I mean. Uh, the first question is mainly for Billy, but I think other panelists could jump in as well. So the question asked about a stadium in Las Vegas, what additional assets it intends to bring to tourism that is not yet present in entertainment in Las Vegas? All right, I'll take the first step. Uh, a great question. Um, I, I I think what this stadium does is to offer what we couldn't compare to the past. I think this is a level, new level of experience. Um, it's a it's a new uh, dimension to the product mix we offer as a destination. Uh, without a stadium. There wouldn't be Super Bowl 2024 in Las Vegas. Uh, there wouldn't be BTS World Tour in Las Vegas. Um, so I think this physical facility um, does provide the tangible asset to uh, what we um, offer as a, as a destination. And um, although as a resident, who lives in Las Vegas, it also creates um, 
chaotic situations where, where when there is a game or there's an event, you're not going to go to the other part of the town. You basically stay put or you'll be part of the fun uh, or chaos, so to speak. But overall, I, I think if you um, look at the contributions this stadium uh, makes to the city uh, and, and the general attitude of, of the community, I think overall, very positive. Hope Thank I answered the question. Thank you. Uh, any other of the panelists, any other panelists want to jump in and talk more? If not, I we just, can move. I just want to say that, you know, big infrastructures like that, they create a whole range of opportunities for places. Uh, but they'll only work if they are um, supported by the infrastructure. And the infrastructure is not that a, a stadium appears, but, but it needs to be a smart city that supports the stadium and supports the events and and is telling to people which way to go if they would like to avoid the, the traffic and, and all the rest of it. So like any assets that they are emerging in different places, uh, for them to be fully utilized, they need to be integrated to the infrastructure of the city and they need to be part of a, of a smart management that brings all of the different uh, elements together. Thank I you. Also, I, I wanted to add that uh, I think it's a little bit of a, a paradox that we have to um, maybe explore where uh, we have the metaverse, we have, um, you know, streaming, we have all this entertainment that we can consume uh, as individuals uh, in from our very convenient uh, living rooms, right, or uh, even outside or whatever, uh, we can take that entertainment with us now. Uh, and still, there's still uh, the need uh, to get these masses of people together, um, because the kind of experience you will have in a stadium is is not replicable in the same way right now in the metaverse or in, in any uh, other way. And so we have to think about what the essence of that experience is. And, uh, but also I think um, the stadium experience is evolving uh, quite um, tremendously. Uh, I live 20 minutes from uh, SoFi Stadium here in, in LA. Um, I mean, you you have the opportunity to experience a game uh, in so many ways now. You have drone shows. You have these incredible experience displays happening on this uh, large scales that still make this, um, um, uh, I think, a, a valuable um, offering. Right? People people will actually go to Las Vegas to see. ETS, even though they could watch them on YouTube or stream them on Spotify. Can I can I suggest something for you? Because this is very, very interesting. I think what's going to happen is, is you're going to have hybrid experiences. And, and you will probably use kind of some kind of metaverse that although you are in the stadium to have the atmosphere and to be with everybody else and celebrate or commiserate or whatever, at the same time, you'll be using technology so you can have the close up of, 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 the, uh, of, of the person who is scoring the goal or, or you know, all the different things. Because, and, and that will be on, on also on a lot of the physical things like a parade. You go to a parade to be part of the parade, but you would like to see the parade, but you cannot see the parade from where you're sitting behind the, 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 the tree. So I think we are gonna go towards a, a hybrid kind of environment where digital and physical they'll be blended and will be in and out of, of this situation. Well, if you go to a baseball game or a football game, and I'm outing myself as, as, a, as an anti-fan, <laughs> I guess, but uh, I mean, the, the games are so boring. Most people are sitting there with their phones, right? Looking, <laughs> looking at uh, maybe, you know, the scores even on their phones instead of and and uh, they they wake up and then watch the the replay on the big screen. Um, but it's the social experience that can't yes. be replicated. And and we never talk about energy and 
and uh, kind of like um, um, uh, mirror neurons and, and, and this kind of really this, this bodily experience of an event um, where I think uh, we, we need some more um, research also to, to see how we can um, maybe copy that, uh, transfer that into the metaverse, or on the other hand, maybe uh, make it even better in, in the real world. Uh, so how do we create these digital uh, experiences better? For those people who are attending, I would love a paper on this. Thank you. Thank you for all the answers from the panelists. For the sake of time, let's move on. We have four more questions to answer. The second question says, how will the robotic system conceived and configured with principles of artificial intelligence meet cu customer satisfaction effectively and efficiently knowing that at some point it may have some technical errors concerning its software and hardware. So how will be its evaluation against this scenario? I can jump in there if you want to, Daisy. Um, Go ahead. You know this. This is um, this is is the classical innovator's dilemma. You know, basically, when when new innovations are introduced, um, the reaction of the incumbents, the industry, is typically, "Oh, that will never work. Uh, it doesn't work very well. It's got errors. It gets lost. It bumps into people." Um, but basically, you know, if they push ahead over time, the product service, whatever it happens to be, will um, incrementally improve and will come be become better and better and better. Um, if we just stop because the first version isn't very good, um, then we're never going to actually get anywhere. So I, I think we need to experiment and we need to start using new technologies, whether it's robotics or, or anything else, uh, and assess their potential and gradually improve them uh, so that they can, uh, in the case of robotics, improve efficiency and maybe reduce costs and so on, uh, and maybe address some of the problems that Uli was talking about in terms of staff shortages and so on. So, um, you know, you start small and then you improve and you improve and you improve. And then eventually what will happen is the solution will be, I won't say faultless, but um, better than it was at the beginning. I guess people remember the first cars, okay, or what they see from the first cars, and what cars did we have in the 1980s and the 1990s, and where we are now. So it's it's the same analogy, really. Well, you use the analogy that Demetrius would love, which is 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 photos. Um, yeah. When remember when you had a flip phone and it used to take a photo but the photo was so bad that you couldn't actually figure out what you'd taken a photo of because it was grainy and horrible. Mm. And now, I mean, with the exception of enthusiasts like Demetrius, when was the last time you saw somebody carrying a camera? Everybody's using their phone because the quality of the pho photography that you're getting is, is really, really good. Uh, Innovator's Dilemma, definitely there. Uh, it was the same thing. Oh yeah. These camera phones, they don't work very well. The quality is not good. Nobody wants to do it. But then it got better and better and better and better and better and better and better until it killed off an entire sector. Thank you. Yeah, I also want to add something about this. So when we talk about technology failure, sometimes it's probably um, not about the technology or device itself. Maybe sometimes about the people who are using them. Uh, we're talking about different group of people. They have different knowledge level, different uh, information accessibility level. So when we're trying to apply different technologies or devices into different uh, consumers groups, uh, we still want to uh, Take a, like a um, uh, take more pay more attention to their usability. For example, uh, the senior tourist group, are they every single one are capable to use very uh, rigorous and very complicated technologies during travel. Um, are we uh, making them overwhelmed? Something like this. Um, so sometimes it's uh, a purely about technology, but sometimes about how people are using those technologies or devices shall we have uh, sometimes like a uh, humanizing those kind of uh, experiences? It, I think it's also very important. 
And I, I think um, I would like to raise the issue of resilience here too, because in smart tourism, we have started to talk about this, um, but, but maybe not enough. Um, and um, so I watched a documentary a long time ago about this one flight uh, that basically uh, dropped almost out of the sky over Indonesia because of the uh, volcanic uh, ash. And um, the main point in the end of the documentary was that because um, air uh, planes have been, or, or the, um, the captains, right, the crew is so reliant now on uh, automation that they actually, in a crisis situation, then don't have the experience anymore uh, to go back to manual. And so instead of um, uh, kind of letting the computer fly the plane when everything's okay, and let the human jump in when things go bad, uh, we need to actually have more of a, a human involvement in the regular flying still so that people still have that uh, knowledge, but also maybe um, have the, the computer uh, be more for also for these exceptional um, cases, right, where, where maybe an AI needs to help you understand what the possible options here would be instead of, um, you know, a, a crew uh, blindly relying on the technology. Now, I wish uh, Guy was still here, but uh, we had a disaster here in the US recently where um, uh, Southwest Airlines basically collapsed. Uh, almost right because of a technological problem. So th this is this is not uh, um, uh, an innovation problem, but it, as Peter said, it's definitely an adoption problem, right? Because the the technology uh, maybe is adopted in a way um, that doesn't build in redundancy in the system, that doesn't have backup, uh, that maybe um, uh, yeah uh, cuts out. Uh, humans in in ways that is is not good. So I, I would like to uh, say resilience. I think is is a topic that we need to discuss more. Thank you. I think the audience said he's really uh, satisfied with uh, and, and our answers. So let's move on to the next one. Uh, so it's asking about how to promote an innovative innovation oriented mindset with students at universities. I wonder if Billy wants to talk something first as an associate dean. <laughs> yeah, I have to put on that hat. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I think, you know, students are the future. They are the future leaders of the industry. I think as educators, we all have the obligation and commitment to hitting them, um, what would the future uh, hold? Um, I, I, I think we need that needs to be reflected in the curricular design uh, because we cannot simply go in and talk about innovation in marketing class or in IT class. I think um, it should be built into the curriculum so that the students will be able to develop the innovative mindset, so to speak. Um, I just give a quick example in at UNLV, uh, our college hospitality, we offer a hospitality innovation class. And that class um, is for everybody, not just for hospitality students, but everybody who is interested in um, innovation um, uh, can, can take it. And, and uh, it's not just, okay, you're a student at UNLV, you'll be able to sign up for it. Uh, the instructor will do the screening to see what you will bring to uh, the table. So in other words, um, the end class project will be uh, something like um, the possibility of, of uh, developing uh, into a patent. So the instructor will work with industry uh, a senior executives uh, to examine uh, the innovative idea the student developed. Um, they have developed over, over time under the instructor's guidance. And as a matter of fact, uh, many of the class projects 
have turned have been turned into um, very successful business ideas and eventually patented. And I remember at least uh, you know a couple of our students um, designed a new gaming device, and the industry uh, has purchased them. And you know, good for the students; they are able to pay off their own education costs. Just that to share as an example. I think, let, let me say something here. I, th I think we really need to recognize that the professor does not have all the answers. And I think what's happening is that a lot of our students will be doing jobs that do not exist yet. So what we find quite often is that academics have actually develop curriculum based on experience and based in the past based on the past but if we have radical innovation going forward what was happening in the past may be totally different from what's happening in the future so i'm trying to learn from my students because they're doing things differently they're digital natives they already operate in a very very different environment and it may be them teaching us rather than us teaching them and, and definitely, when you look into the tourist and the customer of the future, which, let's say, you know, 2030, it's only seven years away, but the students who will be graduating uh, sometime now, they'll be very different consumers in the future. And, you know, I had a conversation today with my students about luxury and what is luxury and, and what people expect with luxury, you know? What people were expecting luxury in the 90s is very different to what luxury will be uh, now or, or in five years time. So we, we need to renovate, we need to uh, innovate and we need the young guys to drive some of these things. Thank can you. I jump in for can, I... can I jump in for one second? Um, yeah. You know, in a very, very practical way, how can we do it? If you think about actually encouraging an innovation mindset, um, I think there's kind of two drivers. One is time and the other is reward. Um, now, in, in an academic situation, we could argue, oh, they've got lots and lots and lots of time. I'm talking time is more about when you're working for a company full time and, you know, the Google 20% uh, uh, scheme and things like that. But reward is something I think is a big motivator, particularly for students. So if we are trying to actually get them to be innovative, um, things like competitions, uh, um, um, having some sort of a, uh, a sponsored competition by a partner, um, uh, I'm trying to think a hackathon, that kind of area as well. Uh, it can be a business hackathon rather than a technical hackathon, but then they need to get reward. And for reward, I think there's two different types of rewards. One is recognition and the other is revenue. Um, so for example, if a student comes up with a great idea as part of a competition, um, who owns the IP? Uh, that's a very, very important question. Is it the student's IP? Is it the school's IP? Is it the university's IP? Or is it the partner who sponsored the competition's IP? Uh, and how are they compensated for coming up with that idea? But you may not even need to compensate them. You know, things like being the winner of the Professor Demetrius Buhalis Award for Tourism Innovation at Bournemouth University is 2025. There you go, Demetrius. There's your objective. Um, that is uh, that is that is that's a very useful line to have on your CV, which maybe might be the differentiator that gets you hired in a job rather than somewhere else. But you know, this is a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's something that uh, uh, can have an effect, but also it, it falls outside what we traditionally do in universities. I suppose universities aren't very good at innovation either is probably a great way of phrasing it uh, because, you know, it's not, oh, we can't give credits for that. Uh, hmm. Thank you. I, I, I think we wanna... only... Oh, go ahead. On, on Peter's uh, comment, which is great. I, I think the university needs to have a structure or mechanism in place. At UNLV, we have an Office of Economic Development. Uh, we even uh, recently hired a director of commercialization uh, that will help uh, not just the student, but also faculty set up their startups. Uh, so they got to be a system in place. Otherwise, 
for professors like us to go through the entire process is a nightmare. Thank you all. I think we only have time to address one more question. Uh, there's the last two questions seems are for Peter. So if you want to type the answers there later or <laughs> I ask them to contact you. And then the, 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 there's one more question seems for Gui. It's really for av aviation question. But this question is very interesting and I really want to know the answer as well. I think panelists, some of you have mentioned, also mentioned the chat GPT. So there is a question regarding chat GPT. How has the use of digital marketing changed the industry with the advent of AI powered tools like chat GPT? So I think this is a very interesting and very hot topic now. Who wants to jump in? Um, yeah, I can I can say a few things. Now I'm coming from the communication, advertising, PR uh, world here mostly. And uh, so content creation is uh, something that is being revolutionized. Um, the industry relies very much on, on human labor at the moment to write press releases, to uh, to write all sorts of product descriptions. If you think about destination websites, for example, how much content they need um, uh, and also how much up-to-date uh, content they need. So this has always been a problem uh, in tourism. Uh, here we see that um, uh, chat GPT can do uh, great things now on the image side with uh, DALI and the quality is not there yet. So uh, I think the photographers at the moment uh, do not have to fear it yet, but the writers for sure. Um, now, what does that mean uh, for marketing? I think um, it, it will just become a lot easier, but I think it will also mean that we need more uh, quality control. Um, that we actually and and unfortunately we don't have that a lot anyways in tourism on these websites so i think that will become even more important um but uh it's happening i mean the industry i think will see a lot of rewards if we use peter's uh typology here in terms of what what uh, encourages innovation and uh, the reward is tremendous because the cost savings are going to be incredible and the opportunity to create more content is absolutely there. Uh, Uli, I'm gonna agree with you and disagree with you. I think that we're back to the point I was making. The potential is great, but okay, if you talk to, I, I'm a specialist in the hotel industry. If you talk to Interconti and Hilton and Marriott, yeah, they're, they're waxing lyrically about um, about AI and content creation and, and even starting to automate the process and build it into their systems. But, you know, when I talk to, for example, some of our MBA students coming from SME or even, you know, even medium-sized tourism companies, and a lot of them are working in marketing, they've heard about it. Most of them have not experimented with it, and very few of them are actually implementing it. So, you know, we need to get people to be more adventurous uh, and, and start experimenting with these technologies, because when you do experiment, anybody that hasn't experimented with it, go and have a go, because it's, it's uh, particularly for text creation, it's, uh, it's stunning. It's absolutely stunning. Uh, I did an experiment recently where I asked it to write a, I asked it to write a 500 word answer on meta search and tourism. And if a student submitted that to me as an assessment, they would have an A+. Plus. It was, I won't say it was perfect, but by God, I was stunned. And, you know, if you ask it to do some of the destination stuff you were talking about it, you know, um, ask it to, uh, what are fun things for 18-year-olds to do in Las Vegas? And it will come up with a blog post for you, which you could use effectively straight off. So, you know, we need to encourage We've got the idea and now even the invention. Now what we need to do is get the bloody things used and then it's going to have its big effect. And, and imagine this is at its worst, worst stage. 
uh, it's basically stage minus five. Uh, imagine when machine learning is, is improving every time you are rating the answer and it's picking up more things. So that, that's something I'm writing right now myself, actually. Okay, so let's, uh, how many more questions have we got, uh, Tete? Uh, we, we covered all the questions. So, okay. and also- Great, okay. <laughs> if, we, if, we, if we covered all the questions and we are two minutes out of time, I think we're perfectly right. And let's, um, let's, let's ask our panel to have a final word and, and say good, good, good morning or good night, depending where you are. Um, starting from Billy. Good afternoon. Nice uh, meeting you all and great insightful uh, discussion. Um, Billy, what do you like to write for Tourism Review based on the discussion you heard today? Innovation. Innovation. Perfect. I'm looking forward to your paper. Uh, Yuli? Um, I really enjoyed it. I think there were a lot of topics uh, that have emerged that um, uh, really we haven't seen a lot uh, in, in the literature. And also, I think there's an opportunity maybe to revisit uh, some topics. Um, and uh, yeah, I've, I've become very interested in, in this topic of um, how consumers maybe seek deeper kinds of experiences, in, including mindfulness experiences. So Demetrius, I'm, um, I think I'm going to submit something on that. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. And, and I think uh, 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 colleagues on the audience, uh, they would like to work with us and, you know, uh, with, with the panel uh, and developing ideas. I think we're kind of um, more than happy to help, especially young academics to actually progress things. And Peter. So it's uh, it's nine o'clock in the morning here on Friday morning. My work day is about to start. Uh, it's been a great way to start the day. Um, so a very, very interesting discussion. Uh, for Demetrius, to keep Demetrius happy, I think I could maybe attack something on why tourism businesses are failing to cross the chasm. I think that'd be a sexy title to have in tourism review. Yay. Super. <laughs> Daisy? Okay. Um, so I think, yeah, it's a uh, uh, night here in the, in, in the UK. <laughs> so uh, yeah, for me and Demetrius. Um, I think this is a very interesting discussion around the um, innovation. Um, but sometimes um, we need to keep in mind, sometimes it's not only the technology or the new things make it innovative. I always teach my students that um, innovation itself is not really purely about technology, but of course it's about how we're using it and how we set up the scenarios and also the interaction with the customers who are using it. So I think that's also a very broad, interesting area. Um, that's all for me. Fantastic. Tete? Um, thank you, everyone. This is late afternoon here, and I just hope the university will be open tomorrow. We have been closed since Monday, and it's still ice outside. So anyway, but for this topic, innovation has been interested in me for a long time. I've been conducting research on technology innovation in the hospitality and tourism industry since I was a PhD student. But for now, I'm thinking uh, more about from the employee side because I see there are so many research already addressed the in, uh, customer's acceptance of their technology, but from employee side, how they uh, can um, co collaborate with technology at the workplace or how do they, whether are they going to use technology, especially like the AI is coming and the chat GPT is coming, how would the um, employees take advantage of these technology to help our industry to provide better customer service might be an interesting topic for me. That's fantastic. So let me conclude the webinar by saying, we really want innovative papers to talk about innovations in tourism. And I think that is the best way that Tourism Review would like to go forward in really addressing the new challenges as they're emerging in the global tourism. 
and look into how um, research can support communities and different stakeholders. Thank you very much uh, to all our contributors. Thank you to all our participants. And last but not least, thank you to Cheche and the University of North Texas for hosting us today and for making this happen despite being closed and despite having uh, a frozen campus. So thank you very much. Uh, have a good time. Looking forward to receive your papers and have uh, and we're going to have a, another webinar on the 2nd of March. Is that correct, Cece? Yes, in one yes. month. In one month time. So Same time. So uh, in the meanwhile, we look forward to welcome your papers and have a look on the innovative papers we've published in the last uh, year or so. Thank you very much. Thanks. Cheers, bye. everybody. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Bye.